Good evening or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, friends. I'm glad you're here. This program is going to be discussing some issues that affect each of us in a major way. Uh, religious liberty is under assault in almost every country currently in the world, particularly in Australia, uh, Austria, and the, the United States. Pastor Larry Kirkpatrick and myself, I'm Jerry Wagoner, Wagoner, are going to be hosting this meeting. And just a brief outline as we get into it, the Australian government is forbidding church members from acting out their faith if they have chosen not to be vaccinated. It's requiring the church, furthermore, to track the vaccination status of all the members and to exclude them from certain activities based on that status. In this next hour, we will be discussing these issues and what a good biblical approach might be to them. When religious liberty is threatened, it affects all of us, friends. Pray for us and with us as we discuss these issues that are threatening to erode religious freedom in our world. First, let me introduce the participants. I'll begin with myself. I'm Jerry Wagoner from Ohio. And then we have Pastor Larry Kirkpatrick from Michigan, up near Muskegon. We have Captain Graham Hood from Australia. Hi, Graham. Glad you're here. Glad to be here, Jerry. And we have Liam. Help me with your last name. And uh, Liam Kutros from Melbourne, Victoria, within the Victorian Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Wonderful. Glad you're here. Good to be so here. Re religious employees now must be vaccinated to work in their assigned churches. And that's happening in Ohio, too, by the way. I just learned on Friday night. What that means is the government is requiring the church to register the vaccination status of church members. In Australia, these are church members who are elected to church office via a nominating committee. Can you believe that? So a greeter by that designation must be vaccinated in order to satisfy the government mandate in Australia. However, members who choose not to receive these products or who cannot provide evidence that they are vaccinated presumably will be prohibited from executing their religious duties. So here's the question. Is there a religious liberty question in these matters? Or to put it more simply, are these religious liberty issues? And I'll leave that question with the four of us. Yeah, I might, I might start off, uh, Jerry. I believe, I believe our religious liberty has been under attack for some time. I think, uh, uh, particularly in the government of Australia, which is divided into several states, there have been state uh, legislations brought forward to de-god our community. It almost seems like God's in the way of uh, of matters of government. And we're seeing clearly um, pictures emerging from the book of Revelation where um, where the government and uh, the, the state and the church are literally eating at the same table, which is really, really disturbing. Uh, in Victoria, uh, we have a premier there. He is to atheism as the Pope may be to, to uh, Protestant Christianity. So it's not... It's not a healthy environment where people are prohibited from practicing a great many religious uh, uh, protocols, and they are also uh, being threatened with imprisonment or fine for matters of even praying about gender dysphoria with their children. So there's a whole raft of things going down. The Premier makes uh, of Victoria, Daniel Andrews, makes no bones about the fact that he uh, he is against religion. Uh, he criticises anybody who practices their faith in any kind of public arena. And uh, it's just symbolic of where we stand. We have a prime minister who I believe said in a very large mega church that when he preached uh, after gaining his prime ministership, that he felt uh, he was ordained by God to be prime minister of Australia. And my thought on that is, well, just by making that statement, he's disqualified himself on both counts, both in the order of being ordained by God and to be prime minister. Um, I think the separation, separation of church and state is a paramount requirement for a good, healthy uh, community of faith to, to be able to live and to practice its, um, its, uh, its mandates and uh, not a good word, but to practice faith in communities where communities are, are needing them to do so. And exclusion from churches based on, on status uh, of health 
flies in the face of everything, in particular the Seventh Day Adventist Church. This seems like a uh, a pretty remarkable thing to to be hearing and, and seeing happen. If indeed this is what's happening, uh, the the government in in, in Judeo Christian culture in the West, in, in Western representative democracy, uh, religion has a very particular place. Uh, the the freedom of, of to follow your conscience is is a real baseline item uh it makes it 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 largely makes the west what it is at least in the good pieces uh to to have the state breathing down people's necks uh whether it's in canada or america or here or somewhere else uh, uh in matters of faith and imposing throwing their weight around and telling people how they can or or cannot practice their faith according to some rule that's been come up with somewhere uh, is is really a, a very giant incursion, if indeed this this is um, what's happening. And I think a lot of our people here in America are probably very shocked to hear this. Probably are hearing this for the first time because I haven't seen it addressed uh, by really the by our church leadership uh, anywhere. And I when I was looking trying to look it up on some of the Australian uh, church materials online, I, I didn't really see it being addressed there in any way. So I think having uh, you, Liam, and you, Graham, uh, to share with us today what's actually happening there and being required of church members there is is uh, is going to be a really eye-opening thing. Uh, is are we understanding this correctly? Is this is this uh, are the, is the government telling the conferences uh, that administrate the churches? Is the government telling them? what they what members can and cannot do can and cannot serve based on their uh, vaccination status is that is that what's happening well in victoria at least as of uh december 16 2021 um the government has now been requiring church officers uh people such as deacons elders these are non-paid roles these are not employees of the church people who, who hold any of these kinds of roles within the church personal ministries leader, you name it. Uh, the government's requiring uh, people of, who hold those kinds of roles uh, to be double vaccinated in order for them to continue in their function uh, of those roles. And I do think this is uh, quite a infringement upon our religious liberty here in Victoria. I agree with all three of you. This essentially makes the church an enforcing arm of the state. I can sum that up in three words. It is wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And and, um, and I'm uh, participating in several Zoom groups that are taking part between um, pastors and employees, former employees of, uh, of the church, such as nurses and teachers, and also some pastoral staff. Um, and it's heartbreaking to see that the church is enforcing a mandate that is that is requiring its staff to go against their conscience, a conscience that's well-founded in, in Adventist beliefs as, as the body being the temple of God, the Holy Spirit. For the church to be enforcing that to the detriment of the employment, livelihood, and even the the, uh, the feeding of families is, is very hard to comprehend. Mm. It's very hard to comprehend that a conference or a union would mandate to terminate the employment of nurses who trained, for instance, in Adventist hospitals, teachers who trained in Adventist universities and schools who've spent their whole lives in the faith, just on the basis that they are upholding what they have been taught from the pulpit for so many decades. I came to Christianity 15 years ago as an atheist. I walked into a church that impressed me. It was a Seventh-day Adventist church on the Gold Coast. The people were and still are amazing. I love the church. I was baptised uh, into it, and, and we, my wife and I were baptised and married on the same day on the 15th of December 2007. And it was a joyous occasion in a beautiful church, and I really felt at home. Like, to come from atheism into, into Adventism was bizarre for me because I had a I had a view of Adventism, as many people do other uh, religious organisations like Jehovah's Witness, um, we had this certain view that uh, there's some kind of a cult. But when I found myself in the church and embraced by it, it was anything but. It was a beautiful, loving environment that, that was preaching a message that was, um, mm. was solid around health, that was preaching a, mes a message that was a bit scary for me at first about Revelation and Daniel. Uh, I initially thought that, you know, I thought it bizarre that people were 
rubbing their hands together at the thought of uh, the end coming very soon. I thought that was crazy at the time. And it wasn't until I, I started to, to try and understand who Jesus was that I found solid relationships in the church. Because when I realized to have my faith, I had to know Jesus. And when I realized that he died a horrible death to give me a second chance, and I'm a recovering pornography addict, I have recovered, thanks to Christ. Um, I, that really got my attention. And, and I became totally enamored and at one with Jesus Christ. And I have been ever since, even though there are times when I've fumbled and fallen. So I, I embraced uh, the church. I, I embraced its mantra. I embraced the, uh, the, the study of the end times. I saw it as a joyful opportunity to perhaps even be around when Jesus comes, to be alive to see him come. I've grown into that. It's been, it's been a wonderful thing which upholds me to this day. And then all of a sudden when uh, 2020 comes along and we have this, uh, this virus happening, to see so many of those things dumped from the pulpit, I find it really hard to understand. I'm now, I'm now, I used to get criticised for wanting to have a cup of coffee or wanting to eat shrimp because I used to love those things. Uh, the smell of bacon used to make me hungry. And I would often joke with my Adventist friends about that. And they would say, oh, no, you know, you've got to, we've got to treat our body like a temple and all that sort of stuff. And I embraced that. I finally got there. I finally got there. And mm. then to be told from the pulpit and through church publications in the organisation that I'm now expected to inject an experiment into my body that has the potential to alter in some ways, God's immune system that he's created for me and potentially DNA, who knows? I'm, I'm a gas. I just think, like, how much can I trust the things that I've been taught from the pulpit in the last 15 years? Can I embrace those things now or are we changing ship in midstream? And I, it, it made me sad. And I, I think, Jerry, you wrote an article on, on a post that I put up about being a sad vendor. And, and some of the pastors I've spoken to uh, I thought would be standing there leading out from the point of view of we really are, we're, this isn't the mark of the beast, but it's the dress rehearsal thereof, and we need to be ready, people. We, if we can't stand now, we're not going to be able to stand when the mark of the beast is implemented. And we all know what the mark of the beast is. It's related to worship. And that is so close. That is just around the corner. And if we can't stand now for this, then how are we going to stand then for that? So I'm deeply perplexed and I'm, I'm deeply perplexed with an organisation that runs uh, operations like ADRA, uh, which support people in times of need, a wonderful health system. The Adventist health system is renowned. Adventist education is renowned. To see those things which have supported this church since the late 1800s so well, to see all those things abandoned in a way when the people who've been brought up in that system are now fired or terminated or without employment with nowhere else to go um i find it really hard to see anything other than evil acting out within that operation at the moment loving the church as i do i would hate to be i would hate to be an administrator in church of any denomination at this time i would hate to be but i also think it's a test for our church administers, ad administrators to make a stand here and now to really lead out. Well, one thing we all agree on, and I've said it a number of times over the last three months, is that bodily autonomy is the last frontier of personal liberty. Religious liberty itself rests on a foundation of personal liberty. When we lose that, it's over. And that's why it matters. Absolutely. I'm looking at uh, pages in a book, uh, one of my, my, actually my favorite book on my shelf, The Great Controversy, besides the Bible. And I'm looking at page 43, and it's talking about the history of the Christian church. It says most of the Christians, it's talking about the apostasy that came in the early centuries. Most of the Christians at last consented to lower their standard, and a union was formed between Christianity and paganism. Although the worshipers of idols professed to be converted and united with the church, they still clung to their idolatry, only changing the objects of their worship to images of Jesus and even of Mary and the saints. The foul leaven of idolatry thus brought into the church continued its baleful work. Unsound doctrines, superstitious rites, and idolatrous ceremonies were incorporated into her faith and worship. 
As the followers of Christ united with idolaters, the Christian religion became corrupted and the church lost her purity and power and uh, goes on. But uh, it, it seems to indicate that as we go back to that period, there was uh, there was a relatively uh, solid church and uh, people came into it and they brought with them uh, the their the same stuff they had before and they they changed the objects of their worship from one kind of images to another but they really didn't completely come over in their heart and uh, i think for many years we've assumed that our our administrators our pastors our teachers our members you know we're all more or less uh, given over to jesus we want to be his we want to do his will and we just i think thought we were all running on the same paradigm on the same page and I think this sudden global event that's happening to us where the governments have been erasing personal liberties since March 2020 has surprised us all. And it's also been surprising that many of the people who lead out in, in the church uh, don't seem to uh, grasp uh, what's going on. They don't seem to have a, any kind of clear mindedness. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if church has been too easy in the West and I mean, I'm wondering, where do you draw the line if the government comes in and says, now you have to do this, now you have to do that? Like in, in China, the government has come in and told the churches, we're putting a camera in your church, you you have to leave it there. We're going to record everything that happens in your church meetings. I wonder now, I couldn't help but begin to wonder now, if the government in uh, in Melbourne decided, or in New York decided, you know, uh, okay, now we're going to have to bring a camera in and put it in your church, you need to leave it alone, we're going to monitor you know, the, the percentage of attendance and make sure it doesn't overrun our rule or something. I wonder if we would just allow them to put the camera in. Uh, so I think we have a, the church leadership needs to be more muscular than it, it needs to do some, it needs to help us understand what's going on, not make excuses, and sometimes maybe even draw the line and, and say, well, no, we're not going to do this. You, the state, tells us to do this, but this isn't anything you can tell us to do. We're That's not what we're about. We're not here, the enforcement arm of, of the state. We, we have a different mission. Uh, and I think the church needs to step out and show us we can trust our leaders by showing that they are there to help defend the personal liberties of all their members, instead of just saying, here's the latest list of commandments and decrees from the government and we're just going to they told us to jump this high now we're all going to jump this high i don't i don't see that as as what i have expected to come from the leaders and i, I don't think this this uh this meeting here should be a grump out against the church but i think we want to provide some kind of encouragement for church members and help leaders understand that we're in a time where there's a a lot of trust is being reallocated from this and that. The trust of government, trust of the medical part uh, of our world is being reallocated because of the impositions and the coercion that, that many of us have experienced. Mm. Uh, isn't this a time then for us to uh, combine together as a church, uh, press together and uh, revitalize our understanding of personal liberty? Is this just something we leave to the personal liberty department guy and or is this something that every member sort of should be embarked on sustaining the personal liberty, your own personal liberty and the liberty of your family members and your, your fellow believers in Jesus? Mm. I think this is something that uh, we do need to work as a team um, in order to prevent, uh, you know, further bad laws from being uh, legislated and not just leave it to a, a small select group. Otherwise, it's quite unlikely that anything can get done that way. And just to give you an example of, of where uh, a large number of people have made uh, quite a difference in uh, preventing uh, preventing things from the legal perspective here in in Victoria uh, is with the with a bill known as the Pandemic Management Bill uh, 2021. Um, and this bill uh, that was proposed, which the uh, Labor Party here in, in Victoria were really trying to uh, push through to legislation uh, without, with, while keeping uh, as little number of people as possible in, in the know in regards to it. It was such a, the amount of power that it would give to the Premier of Victoria and his, uh, and his health officer was uh, yeah, quite, quite huge. Uh, giving him dictatorship-like powers, totalitarian-like powers, 
And um, the people of Melbourne here spoke up against it. And in the cities, weekend after weekend, there were huge protests. I think there were uh, some weekends where we had uh, uh, over a million people there at one time, uh, quite possibly even huge, which is a very significant uh, percentage of the population here in, in Victoria. And I think as a, as a result of these protests, although this pandemic uh, management bill did uh, get legislated in the end, it had to be amended first. It was amended and um, it, it, made it, it made it so that the Premier uh, didn't get as, you know, dictatorship-like powers. Uh, now, the, the things that he wants to get done in regards to controlling people, um, it needs to be run through a particular uh, body of people first and be approved by them. Uh, it still gives the government major powers. Um, but it just shows that weekend after weekend of so many people protesting against this bill, people power and a not large number of people uh, protesting can make a big difference. So I have a question hmm. on that. Uh, many people would say we shouldn't, and usually I would say we shouldn't probably become involved in a lot of protest type activities as church members. However, when we're looking at basically a forced renegotiation, I guess there's no such thing as a forced renegotiation, is there? We're looking at basically a, a shift, a involuntary shift in our personal liberties, expectations. Uh, when we see that they're basically changing the social contract out from under us, and instead of doing it with us, uh, us working together, they're just basically imposing new changes that they want they want us to have less personal liberty and and follow more of the rules they set out for us etc cetera, etc cetera. when they're doing that i mean what should the role of church members be should we should we just stand by or should we just continue to meet i mean when does the church have to go underground when does government imposition become so strong that in order to be faithful in following jesus uh the church has to, to begin meeting so to speak uh, clandestinely to avoid the, the government incursions. I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not sure what the answer is, but I do know that once the government is forcing the church to run a registry of who has and who hasn't been vaccinated, for me, for me as a church member, I, I, I just that's just completely across the line. How, I don't don't see how we can agree to that. Yeah. Yeah, look, we, we, um, I've attended and spoken at four rallies. I don't go as an activist, I go as an evangelist, a reluctant evangelist. It, ha it has actually been bearing fruit. I, I, believe, I believe if we as, as a church do nothing and allow the government to overrun our institution, then we are denying ourselves great opportunities to reach people at the time of greatest need. We are at the moment already going underground with our churches. There are home church groups forming for the unvaccinated. It's really sad. It's really sad. But uh, Zoom churches are very popular now. But it's not the same. There's nothing like pressing the flesh with your brothers and sisters in Christ in fellowship every, every weekend um, and joining together in other activities through the week. There are many home churches starting up. Um, there are a great number of pastors now who are organising themselves to give Zoom Bible studies for people who are coming out of the rallies wanting to know God. I spoke at one rally in Sydney with Michelle. We believe there were between 180 and 300,000 people in front of the sound stage. Those people are very, very um, supportive of what we're saying, of what I'm saying. And when I pray with them, I, I glance up every now, now and then when I'm praying and I see 90% of their faces bowed. I see people holding up uh, slogans supporting Christ. And, and if the death on the cross wasn't a protest, I don't know what was. It was a protest against evil in support of the love of God. And so um, in the crowd, wherever I speak now, because I, I always raise the topic of Desmond Doss and I, I raise the topic of the Sabbath, I spoke only uh, once on, no, twice on, a, on no, once on a Saturday. Uh, that was in Sydney and I prayed about that. And God impressed me in no uncertain terms that I was actually going to evangelise in the church. That I really felt that the people at that rally were his church and he wanted to speak to them through somebody. And so I told the story of Desmond Doss and I asked them to pray and I asked them to dare to be like Desmond. And many of them put their hands up. Now, after the hour, my particular speech, 
we went to a speaker's tent off to the the side of the sound stage, which was cordoned off so that we could rest and, and recuperate because it's a pretty stressful day. We just marched around nine city blocks ahead of 300,000 people. It was incredible. But when we were sitting in the tent resting, one of the security guards came in and he said, would you and your wife mind coming outside the barricade here with me for a minute because there are hundreds of people queuing up wanting to talk to you. So she and I walked out, stood outside the barricade for three hours and all we did was pray for individuals. They were queuing up, they were hugging us and asking us to pray for them. They were saying that every night they listened to the, the little uh, video that I put out which has a spiritual component at the end. And I warn people, I'm about to go into the spiritual component. If you don't want to be part of that, then you can check out now. But most people are saying they stopped looking at that at the beginning, but now they listen to it. We've had people uh, asking us to pray with them who've never prayed before. We've had people say to us, an old lady said to me one day, I, I haven't prayed since I was a little girl kneeling beside the bed. And now I pray with tears in my eyes every night with you. Some enterprising churches who don't agree with the mandates avail themselves of copies of uh, literature that they could guide people to the electronic versions of Great Controversy. And they had thousands of copies of Great Controversy. And every time I speak at a rally, they're there handing out these thousands of copies of Great Controversy. Wow, oh, amen. And, and we see, we're seeing people reading them in the park when the rally's over. They're sitting on park benches reading them. I've seen politicians who were speakers at that event sitting there while they were waiting to speak, reading the great controversy. And I said, you guys need to read the last six, cha six chapters. Go there now because this is relevant. There is a golden opportunity to evangelise those, those people waiting, begging to come to God who feel that they can't get there. And I sadly have heard uh, of, of uh, several uh, hierarchy of our church uh, the church that is the apple of God's eye, the church that we are meant to love and we do love, say that my, my attendance at these rallies and my evangelism is an embarrassment to the church and that uh, I'm too over the top. And, um, and that's really sad for them, but not for me, because I feel impressed to do what I'm doing, even though I, you can call me a reluctant evangelist. But the things that really concern me now about where our church is going is we have seen a massive push by some of the hierarchy and some of the more prominent faithful in the church pushing towards the mandate and almost vilifying those of us who don't. In fact, actually vilifying those of us who don't. It's like a righteous indignation against people who don't get mandated as we're selfish and greedy and we're, we're not thinking of our brothers and sisters. Thanks for sharing those experiences, Graham. That's a very... Uh, endearing look behind the scenes of what you've experienced down there. A lot of people are hungry for truth right now. And one thing I've noticed, both in the church and out of the church, there is a pervading sense of alienation in people. <laughs> a lot of people feel alone. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. And when we talk about the church, and that's what each of us represent here tonight, most of the church seems to be comforting themselves that if it doesn't involve the Sabbath, it's really not that important. Courage is a way of life. It is not a commodity that you can purchase at the last minute when a time of trouble arrives. It's either a way of life or it isn't. And so we have all these questions. What's going on with the Religious Liberty Department of the church? Uh, Larry, you, you brought this. A question that needs to be asked. Religious liberty appears to be sitting on its hands lately, uh, possibly to keep them from getting cold, as cold as their feet. Into that vacuum, some of the laymen have stepped up, focusing on personal liberty and freedom. The uh, uh, Liberty and Health Alliance, for instance, here in America, is one example of laymen just stepping into this vacuum. And so the implication is that if these people who are hired to protect the church in this area aren't going to do it, if they're not going to protect my personal liberty, then I guess I'll have to do it. And that's the thought that I'm hearing in a lot of people's minds and hearts. It's interesting to remember that God reserves some of his harshest condemnations in the Bible for shepherds that destroy or fail to protect the flock. I think of Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34, and Zechariah 11. People are speaking out about the mandates as a result of this vacuum, but quite often these aren't people that have any power to affect change or stop the mandates. So all we can do is encourage one another, let people know they're not alone, 
and tell God that we're available so he can use us. No, I, I'm just agreeing. Absolutely. I've, I've, I've been talking a bit too much. I want to hear some other points. Uh, it, this uh, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6 came to my mind uh, as we were talking. And because, uh, you know, we hear about a lot about love. And if you, you take this one action, you're loving. And if you don't take this, you don't do this thing you're supposedly supposed to do, you're supposedly not loving. But let's look again and, and see what the Bible actually says. So it's verse 6. It's talking about the characteristics that, um, that pertain to what love is. And you know the list. We're all familiar with this text. But verse 6, six says, it does not rejoice in iniquity, that is sin, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. I think there's a lot of people today who uh, the this seismic shaking that's happened across the globe is leading a lot of people to that question in a way that's probably surprising to some of us. Uh, what what is truth? You know, the one question that of all people in the Bible who asked it, Pilate asked it to Jesus right to his face, and then he doesn't stick around for the answer. Well, we've got an opportunity today to to understand more about the answer what what is the loving action to do is it the loving thing to say okay here's a list of commandments come out by the government you have to do this if you don't do this you're not loving or is it more loving to say and what we've tried to do in my churches and my churches have been good with this thankfully thank god that if you choose not to be vaccinated we love you we respect you you're part of our church family if you choose to be vaccinated, we love you, we respect you, we're so glad you're part of our church family. We, we, we are all on the same team looking to hasten the day when Jesus comes. And so if we can live together instead of saying, okay, here's a list of the vaccinated people, they're all evil, or here's a list of the unvaccinated people, they're all evil, you know, we're at different places in our understanding. I, I'm still learning, you know, we're all still, I think, figuring out uh, right. and, and kind of landing, I think we're all kind of landing here and there, trying to trying to be in, in a place where we can understand what uh, what's happening in our world. I mean, I understand, I was talking to a couple of people today uh, that say that, um, that the police, that when the policeman gets into his car in the morning, he starts off by thinking, uh, I was talking to a former police officer who was saying, he always would start his day thinking, well, if this happens, what do I do? If this, he was kind of going through a whole bunch of what ifs. And they kind of have a, a process for depending on what happens in that day, what they'll do about it. Military, uh, talked to some, a totally different person who said that the military was always about having current information. What is the current state of affairs? What's going on right now? And so what's the church doing? The church should be helping its members know, hey, what is the current state of affairs? What's going on right now? The church should be, I think, in, in my mind, we should be asking the question, okay, what do we do next? What, what do we just, are we just supposed to sit and do what we're told? by Caesar, uh, is that the way the early church was? Or is there a, a different a different plan for us? I mean, if God gave us the health message, why have we sat down quietly being told about all these health principles, and many of which are, we're finding out now have, have are being changed suddenly? We were told it was about the science early on, and now they're changing the uh, whole bunch of things, but it's because of the science now. Well, I thought it was because of the science then. So, the, the church is the tail and not the head. God wants us to be the head and not the tail. That's why he gave us a, right. a strong health message. And so, I don't know, it, it seems like the, the, the Super Bowl has started and we're kind of, we're kind of shuffling around in the dugout. We haven't got out onto the field and we're just following what we're told to do when we should be seeking God's guidance and doing what he tells us to do. You know, in Romans, it talks about, you know, we should obey the laws of the land as long as they don't they don't transcend or, or, or trample on God's law. Um, and I, I believe that's true. I believe that's true. So people say to me, why are you at the protest? Well, the primary law of the land in Australia is the Australian Constitution that was set up in 1901 or 1900. And the, the rules of the Australian Constitution, which is the top of the, of the pile of law, it is the law. Everything else is sub is is subdued to say to the Australian Constitution. So that's the law, the law of the land that I need to follow. It is the supreme law. It protects us from border closures. It protects us from vaccine mandates. It protects it protects us from medical conscription. There are so many wonderful protections built in, into our constitution, but our constitution has been 
undermined, if not completely trashed, because our country became a corporation in 1973 and stopped being a constitutional monarchy. And as such, the Australian constitution, which should bind everybody under one rule of law, has been shelved. So we have all these different states, seven or eight different jurisdictions when you count the territories, that are imposing their own version of the law. And it varies from border to border to border. We have corporations who are, who are imposing policy, corporate policy, as if law. Our mm -hmm. own church is just one of those groups. We are a corporation imposing policy as law. So I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've had to answer this criticism of some people. I obey the constitution of the people of Australia, the constitution of, the, of, of our government formed in 1900. That's the, the law of the land I obey. And everybody who does something different to that is breaking that law. Now, we can't let that happen. We cannot let that happen. How many disciples were not persecuted because they broke uh, Roman or Jewish mandates? They were all persecuted and all but one to death. Am I right? So where do we go with that? We have, we have to speak up for the institution. And I think our biggest problem as a church is that we can't separate from being a corporation into an institution of faith that isn't corporate based. It's because we have businesses. It's because we have, um, we have hospitals and churches and properties and we have to pay salaries and we have to pay insurance. We have a massive legal uh, bill that we pay every year. Uh, legal firms in Australia have been given a mandate by the Australian Union Conference. I understand if ever the church comes against any opposition from within, use all your resources to crush it, no matter what. Uh, we've been told that by by people who were involved in that system who were who were doing the best they could to crush people who raised objections about childhood sexual abuse. Those things have slowly been changing. The big battle is for church administrators, and most of them are pastors, how do they divorce themselves from the pulpit and the boardroom? That's the burning question, I think, that that needs to be answered amongst every denomination that's facing this dilemma. And... I, I personally, I believe that if if the church, if the pulpit is doing God's work, then God will protect the corporation that supports it. And I think if we can't get our hand around that, then we are letting down those people who are leaning on us at this time of great crisis, at the edge of a crisis that's going to be much worse than this one just around the corner. God honours those who honour him. And the question is, uh, do we believe what that passage says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30? Do we trust in it? that God will honour us if we honour him. That's it. You know, when Michelle and I, when I posted my video, I realised I was ending a career uh, two years in advance of my end date because I had, I had uh, allocated funds from my employment to finish a, a missionary project that we've started here where we live to help restore the broken lives of, of victims of childhood sexual abuse and, and addicts. We, we've got one more building to complete and we, we don't have the funds. And I looked at Michelle and I said, you realise if I send this video, it's the end of my career and the end of our ministry dream. But we both realise that God owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. And if he wants our ministry dream, if it's his dream to come to fruition, then he will honour and respect it and it will happen. And if it doesn't, it was never meant to happen anyway. So we've stepped out in faith. We stepped out at a time of financial um, uh, nothingness, really. We had nothing behind us at all when we made that decision. But we've had adequate funds come through from people to support us to make sure the wolves are kept from our door. They're modest, they're adequate, and that's all they need to be. You know, we pray for God to give us this day our daily bread. We don't pray for a year's supply of bread because it would all go bad before we got to eat it. If we honour God, he will honour us. I, I totally agree, Liam, and, um, and that's what we're doing. And so far, uh, that tree is bearing fruit. And so we live under the shade of that tree and keep honoring it. Amen. Thank you for that verse, Liam. Thank you for bearing testimony to that passage, Graham. Graham, you said something that resonated with me, that the church is a corporation or seems like a corporation anymore. That is an observation that I've made with some uh, sadness recently myself. I would put it this way. Too many of our church conferences and unions and maybe the division, maybe even the GC, they seek the input of risk management instead of living and operating by principle. Risk management is fine as long as it's kept in its right place. 
But when you invite risk management into your board meetings and you give them a high place of honor, and also you invite culture to come in and sit in these meetings, and principal usually gets pushed aside. Principal is lightly regarded. And so risk management nowadays is leading our institutions to adopt wokeness. Why? To avoid the uncomfortableness of the cancel culture mob. Lawyers in our church are desperately afraid that our church might come under the um, scrutiny of a cancel culture mob or be the target of a, of a Twitter storm of some sort, an outrage mob. And so some of them are inclined to yield to wokeness as a way of mitigating risk. It's easier, in other words. That's not the way God has laid it out, is it? God wants us to live by principle, to love people, and to love the truth. And we do that, we'll be all right. Well, it all depends on which law lens we look at life through. Do we look at it through the litigious law lens, the, the law of the land lens, or the law of love? And um, and sadly, I think that this, this uh, particular pandemic, as they, uh, they are calling it, has put our church in the, into the framework of looking at this through the law of the land and not the law of, of love. And how God views that is, is, going to be, is going to be telling. And so we're constantly praying for our church leadership to see what's coming, to step away from political correctness and to step into, yeah. into the grace of God and trust that God will look after the corporation and the church if we're faithful to his purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we need legal teams? I guess every corporation has to have one. Do we need big insurance policies? I guess they're mandated and sometimes we have to live with those. In the New Testament church, I don't think they had a very big legal team. And they seem to, uh, yes, they had to obey God rather than men sometimes, but they seem to go about the work of the gospel, turn the world upside down in one moment. I mean, not against godly lawyers, but um, when do we when do we stand up for the faith and say, say, this isn't your business, this is our business? Like, like Jerry said near the beginning, God gave me a conscience, and uh, it is my conscience has to do with my body. You and your conscience have to do with your body. Yeah. My conscience doesn't have to do with your body. My conscience has to do with my body. God assigned it that way. And so well, as soon as we start allowing external groups with their own agendas to tell us uh, what, we, what we do with our bodies— uh, it seems that, that they've really crossed a line into our space, and I don't even think that Romans 13, uh, nowhere in the Bible actually do I see where the, the, the authority that's given to kings and governments is an authority over, your, over people's bodies in general. God gave us that authority over our bodies, and so the church should, it seems to me, strongly support and uh, nurture the peace of conscience in us that says, I'm going to try to be faithful. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I'm going to decide, according to my faith, understanding what I do with that body. You, you know, hands off. <clears throat> yeah. In a kind way. You hands off. This isn't your business. You go and decide what about you do about your body. But as a Christian believer, I have to say that this my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God has put it on me, the responsibility and the guilt or, or uh, non-guilt about what I do with that is is mine. So you can't come to me and, and tell me what to do with that. That's not your business. You're, you've crossed the line. And we have a, a technocratic group of people who today want to cross the space and get into everybody's business. And the church, I think we can be kind and gentle and loving and, 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 and kind to people. But I, I don't think we have to say, okay, I'll do just what you say while you're standing on my feet to force me to do it. I can kindly say, I hear what you're saying. I'll give it the. I'll give a thought. I'll decide what to do though, because God has placed it on me. At this moment, I decline. Um, you know, we, when we talk about when we when we talk about protesting, uh, Nebuchadnezzar laid down some pretty strong mandates for Daniel and his three friends and the people of Babylon. And Daniel and his three friends uh, said no to the mandate. They respectfully declined, and they they lived by God's will and God's word rather than Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and how did God protect them? With everything, with absolutely everything. I mean, so that, you know, people talk about the Bible contradicts itself. It, it doesn't. It's type and, and anti-type. And when we put them all together, we can see a clear picture. Mm -hmm. So um, 
mandates and laws are very different things. I, I mean, you talk about somebody who's who's racing his injured child to hospital uh, in his car. Uh, he can't wait for an ambulance to come. The child is bleeding out. He gets in his car and he's doing, you know, 60 miles an hour in a, in a 40 miles an hour zone. And the police see him and the police chase him. And he thinks, well, you know, my son's going to die if I don't break this law. Uh, so he, he keeps speeding and disobeying the police order. He runs a red light. He looks carefully. He sees there's nothing coming. It's late at night. There's no one there. He runs the red light. The police are getting more and more anxious about it. And he breaks several laws all the way to get to the hospital. And he races into the hospital to get his son the treatment he needs. Has he been illegal or unlawful? What's the difference? We have to draw a line between what is morally required of us to do in spite of the man-made laws that we live under and we have to sometimes we have to break those laws in order to achieve the outcome that has to be achieved for for compassion and love to prevail i don't know anybody who would not speed in a situation like that does that make you an unlawful person we we are in this we are in this very complex situation now uh, liam if i can ask you a question are you at this moment living into what you believe god requires you to live into as far as your profession yes yes i am and are you being restricted in living out God's will for your life as a result of these mandates and what the church is imposing? Uh, yes, I, I have definitely been uh, restricted. And your role is to what? What What do you see as your purpose in life? Oh, wow. That's, that's, a, that's a huge question. Um, well, ultimately, I want to be uh, fulfilling the will of the Lord wherever I can. And I know that will vary from one person's life to another differently. Um, and I'm in my life trying to do it the best I know how to. And, um, and yeah, this year I've been employed as a, as a youth pastoral worker uh, for the Victorian Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, um, and yeah, I've been doing many Bible studies as, as a part of my role there. And um, yeah, since the, we've had the vaccine mandates back in October, um, yeah, we've had these restrictions being placed upon whoever's not vaccinated at, at least the victorian conference has been uh quite good to me in allowing me to keep my job it's just that there exist many uh limitations uh upon me uh so i can't for example do bible studies with people in person i need to uh do it over the phone or through zoom uh for example and um one of the things i was told over the phone by one of my superiors is something i couldn't even do was um delivering a, a food parcel, something as little as that. And um, I have been limited in that I uh, can no longer, as long as I retain my employment, I cannot go to attend the, uh, the Adventist church that I am employed under due to the fact that it is considered a location of, of work for me. Even if they were to hold a church service in, in the park um, for the unvaccinated and vaccinated, I, I, I still couldn't go. Um, I, w I was told uh, some months ago, and now ever since December 16, all the churches have been um, open to both vaccinated and unvaccinated without any uh, number limitation. Um, however, I still can't attend the church that I am employed under. I can attend other Adventist churches as long as I'm not employed under them. Just so, yeah, the one that I'm employed under, I, I still cannot attend. So. That's uh, where things are at for me at the moment. So, so just to clarify, um, the government came down with the rule. They passed the rule to the conference, and the conference has passed the rule on to you. Am I understanding that correctly? This wasn't something the conference came up with. This was something that is imposed on your employing church organization, and that they, they are sort of passing it on to you. But the government's the originating <laughs> source of this rule, right? This the state. Yes, yes, I, I believe that would be correct. Yes. So. Um... A government mandate is preventing you from fulfilling God's role for your life. Uh, I, I think I think all of us are in the same position. Do we or do we not still have a great commission? I believe we, we still do. We still do. And um, I had planned to spend my life catching bass in retirement, and I will probably never put a line into the into the river. And um, and what I'm being asked to do now sometimes feels like it's way out of my depth. But I've been taught for 15 years every time I sit in front of a pulpit that my role as a Christian, an Adventist Christian, is to fulfil the Great Commission. And yet um, we can only do that within the limits and the bounds of government mandates, which aren't really laws. 
their mandates. There's a big difference. Yeah. We are we are in a, a state of emergency. We really are. We are in a state of faith emergency. There is a great shaking going on. And some people, I believe, are hoping that it's not going to happen just yet because it's interfering with their plans. You know, they, they'd set aside things to do with their lives. I did. But I want to be on the right side of history. I want to. I don't want to be out in front of God. I want to be close enough behind him to hear his voice and to, and to walk in his shadow forward with him. And it's frightening to think that sometimes I may be tempted to run ahead of him. I need to keep placing myself behind him. And if the, the sole purpose of us doing this, we know what the end is. Revelation and Daniel make it really clear. Matthew 24 make it really clear what the end is. We know that. We know that all we're really doing is we're not fighting for a victory here. We're fighting a stalling action, a delaying action. And that action allows us to reach as many people as possible, like the young people who want to hug me and pray with me and Michelle at the rallies, who desperately need to be able to do that with Liam and who are prevented from doing that with Liam because of a government mandate. That to me tells me that we're, we are in a position of faith crisis in the world and in Australia in particular. And if we don't deal with that with courage and strength and outspokenness and love and respect, remembering always that as Adventist Christians, we understand to, in our hearts that this is the apple of God's eye. We love it. We disagree with it at times, but we still love it. And we have been running a thing called Church Without Walls for about 15 years while still attending our mainstream church. And it was a church we set up for people who were recovering addicts who felt that they couldn't step into a normal church because they, they would have felt too judged and their copybook was too heavily blotted for them to be able to do that. So we ran fellowship in our back garden every Saturday afternoon on based on Acts chapter 2. Uh, no board, no, no tithe, people tithe where they wanted to, no pastor, just fellowship around the meal. And it would last from 1 in the afternoon till sometimes 10 o'clock at night. And people from all walks of life would come in, covered in tattoos. And, uh, some people with gender orientation issues and whatever, they just came because they felt they could get to know Jesus in a friendly environment. And at one stage, it was suggested that we were perhaps setting up a breakaway, which was never our intent. It was meant to be a stepping stone for people to come through brokenness into the main body of the church with baptism and, and forming relationships. And so a couple of pastors were sent around one Sabbath afternoon to see what we were doing and at that afternoon we had nearly a hundred people in our back garden and one of the pastors leaned over to me and he said what are you doing i said oh we're just doing acts chapter two no he said what are you doing that's attracting these people i said well we're not judging them we're not condemning them we're making a safe place for them to come and get to know jesus and he said whatever it is you're doing keep doing it because you had more people in your garden this afternoon than i had in my church this weekend this sabbath so keep doing what you're doing. And that's the way we need to approach this in our history now, in this time in Earth's history. If we're not doing that now, we are missing an, an evangelism opportunity of the most incredible proportions. We could end this in a heartbeat if we just let go of the reins and just allowed God to lead us to a place where people can come and understand the essence of God's love through Jesus Christ and us being the only Bible they may ever read, by seeing Jesus in the way that we live out our lives. Whether we stand at a rally protesting or whether we're handing out great controversies at the back of the crowd, it matters not. We have a great opportunity here and now to see something that is biblical, to see something that will, that will want to bring Jesus back sooner. Mm -hmm. And so as we know the end from the beginning, we also know that any time we have now should be used wisely to get as many people into the lifeboat as possible. And I think that's what we're all dedicated to do. And if we're not dedicated to do that, we need to realign our focus. I agree that our church missed out on a huge opportunity last year and probably still is this year as well. Last year, people saw these huge forces aligned against them and they were frightened. They were more frightened than they've ever been in their life. They saw these huge global forces aligned against them, including social media and many other avenues. And they desperately wanted to know how God felt about all this. They wanted to know how God felt about what was happening. The church could and should have stepped into that moment and provided answers and encouragement for people. I'm sad to say the Adventist church didn't, 
do a very good job on that. And I don't say that to be critical. I just say that to observe what reality is. John MacArthur in California, his church grew between three and 4,000 people simply because they stepped into that moment with courage. And courage was magnetically attractive to so many people. They had to go to more services just to have room to hold them all. Something was mentioned earlier. I don't know if it was uh, Larry or Graham about a church, uh, an underground church. And that's a term that I've become familiar with through Conrad Vine in the last uh, three or four months. I don't know a lot about it, but I would like to ask this question or pose the question to all of us. Uh, when should a public church consider going underground or should they? I think a, I think a public church needs to consider going underground. The, our local church have, have, uh, gathering, have been gathering in homes for a long time and it's only a small company. And they had some funds and they wanted to build a church. And I think they saw the wisdom of not doing that because church buildings are going to become targets in the future. Yeah. I think we need to be underground. But even, even as a public church, we need to think underground. We need to think in, in, a, in a rebellious way for Jesus. We need to think as though we are underground. We need to act as though we are underground. And we need to prepare ourselves to go underground. Um, interestingly, when Liam was talking about the restrictions placed on, on his attending the church uh, as a place of employment, in Queensland at the moment in particular, and in other states as well, there are hundreds if not thousands of businesses and also local government bodies, uh, shires and councils, who are saying, we're not going to enforce these mandates. We're not your police force. We're remaining open and we're telling our businesses they can remain open. And a lot of the businesses, restaurants and cafes, who are saying we're not requiring masks and we're not requiring you to check in, they're filled and the other businesses who aren't doing that are empty. And you know what? The people who go to those businesses are forming human shields around them to stop the police from going in to issue fines and notices. And it's working. If little cafes and restaurants without any kind of faith base can do that, what could our churches do if we had the courage of John MacArthur? Well, well what a, what a, uh, what a, what a challenge, what a call, call to, to challenge there. It, yeah. It's there for us to do. And there are some pastors in the Zoom groups that I'm talking to, and sadly, they have to remain anonymous, most of them, mm. because of the fear of retribution in some way or another, whether that's real or, or just um, perceived. Um, they're starting to do that. They're saying, well, I may lose my employment, but God has a bigger calling for me. And they will be kept busy. Um, I'm hoping that they're going to form network Zoom networks for Bible studies because I want to get to a stage where the people who are approaching us by the thousands, we can divert to people for Bible studies. And I want to see us baptizing people everywhere, everywhere. We need to help them understand the sanctuary message. We need to help them understand the end time message. We need to help them understand the health message. These are the things that are, that are so prominent in our faith. And we need all hands on deck to do that. And we need creeks and dams and rivers filled with people being made wet for Jesus. We're running out of time. Mm -hmm. and, and if we can do that by forming, you know what, if we, if church congregations just stood in a circle outside the building and saying, look, we're not, we're not playing this game anymore and we're not letting you in. There was a, a church pastor in Canada. I don't know whether you saw the video clip. Uh, it was, it was uh, some special ceremony they were holding. I, I don't know what faith they were. And these Canadian police walked in and he ordered them out. Get out. Get out. How dare you come in here? Get out. You criminals, get out. And he chased them down the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was powerful. Um, if we stand in the armour of God, why can't we do that? Very good question. I'm wondering if we could find a better word than rebellion, maybe uh, righteous uh, resistance. In uh, Psalm 68, verse 6, I believe, God says the rebellious dwell on a dry land. Yeah, rebellion, rebellion is not a good word, I agree. Oh, there are so many great words we could apply to that. Mm -hmm. Didn't uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, for a while, there was uh, quite a resistance in Germany, in Nazi Germany. And I think they actually, I, I, at this moment, it's escaping my mind what they called themselves, uh, the German Free Church or something. But I think that resistance is, is not a bad thing. Uh, resistance might be a, a word, a label we can use to provide a righteous resistance or a... Um, an upstanding resistance when people are basically trying to make incursions against our rights, the rights of our children, the rights of fellow church members who are trying to be faithful to Jesus. To resist unrighteousness is not wrong. It is right. So I don't see it as rebellious. I think a lot of people read a lot of things into some of the texts that uh, supposedly like give the government a blank check. 
uh, just whatever they command, we're supposed to do it or else we're being somehow wrong. Yeah. I don't think when we look at the whole Bible picture, I don't think that's fair. I, and I think that um, mm -hmm. there needs to be a, a kind of, of uh, kind resistance that God's, the followers of Jesus need to be, be willing to do. And it may cost us something. Well, we see the example of John the Baptist. His resistance was quite vocal. Uh, he called a spade a spade. And we see that beautiful resistance of Jesus, uh, resistance of love and compassion. Resistance is the way of faith. Uh, resistance is about standing against sin and standing against the forces of evil. We are in a battle of good versus evil. We do have to adopt a stance of resistance or we will be overcome by it. Yeah. I think that Excellent point. A wise spiritual warfare is called for. And the Bible commends that as endurance or being steadfast. So when should a church go underground? My input would be don't do it too fast. Don't do it too fast. Don't look for ways to do it. Jesus said the best time to leave church or synagogue was when they throw you out. You'll find that in John 16, verse 2. I will also say if a shepherd is not protecting his flock, they will often go elsewhere in order to keep from getting destroyed. Go back to what I said earlier. God issues some of his harshest condemnations to shepherds that either destroy or fail to protect the flock. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. A lot of the church is asleep, and my prayer is that we're not. My prayer is that I'm not, because I, I sense those weaknesses in my own soul, my own heart. What we don't want to do is comfort ourselves, that if something doesn't involve the Sabbath, it's not important. That is not true. This issue has the potential to reveal character, and our character is going to set the tone for the final movements in our lives, friend. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. What else would you like to say, brethren? There was something that I uh, wanted to say on the topic of, of missed opportunities spoken of later, um, and I appreciated what Graham was saying. Um, I do think that we have, as a church, had some missed opportunities and have been in a... Uh, the labor is a few, but the harvest is great kind of situation, as in those laboring uh, for those who are against the vaccine mandates outside of our church. There's such a large number of people in that in that vicinity that the church has not been taking this COVID situation advantage of as much as they could. I know Graham has, and he has had some amazing um, evangelistic opportunities, and it's been going amazingly well. And I know here in Melbourne, Victoria, um, there is a, a book stand ministry that I've had involvement with where we, we set up some tables, we give out uh, books for free, and there's a group of Adventists that do stuff in the city. And um, even during the protests, there have been some from our group who have been in the midst of the protests, being there to evangelize and give out literature and uh, I've seen person after person, like opportunity after opportunity come our way um, in regards to people who have been expressing interest. It's like people have been so much more interested uh, these days than they were having before COVID times. And just to give you an example, last week, Sunday, a, a young friend of mine uh, met someone at, at one of the protests. And uh, a few days later, I think it was, uh, I received a, a call from this guy that my friend met at the protest uh, telling me how he was, you know, interested in, in getting into the Bible and uh, he wanted to know where to start, what, what book of the Bible to, to begin with and stuff like that. Um, just to give you an example of, of, you know, where we get interest uh, from, from people. Uh, so we definitely have, you know, in Australia, some people who are taking advantage of, uh, these COVID times and yeah. the vaccine mandates trying to work good out of the bad and using the bad going on as an opportunity for good. Uh, but if the whole church was doing the same, we could have such a huge uh, harvest uh, of people come through this. But unfortunately, uh, the laborers for this harvest um, are few in regards to who's using this uh, unique situation as a, as a powerful opportunity. Yeah, so true. And um, um, but you know, we we call we recall the eleventh hour workers of the vineyard. Um, there are so many parables that, that uh, Jesus uh, gave us to support what we're doing. And 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 on Christmas Day, it was a day of great trepidation for those of us in the welfare movement because um, 
we we know that Christmas is a hard time for people, a lot of people in many ways, because of broken and dysfunctional families. And there were a group of uh, of counsellors and psychologists who were forming up to set up crisis lines over Christmas. And and Michelle and I were very busy over Christmas Day talking to people and zooming with people. Mm-hmm. And we zoomed with a bunch of counsellors who. Uh, one lady said to me, um, you know, where do, where, do we, where do we go with this? How do we handle this situation? And somebody piped up and said, well, we need to understand what love would do in this situation. And going back to 1 Corinthians 13, which we, we really delve in a lot in our work, uh, I piped up and I actually got my Bible out and I said, well, let's think about love. What would love do? And we're told in the Bible that, that God is a God of love. He is love. So when we read 1 Corinthians 13, and I read it to them, I said, love suffers long and is kind. Now, we're relating this to people who've been rejected from their families for Christmas who are alone and broken. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And love never fails. And it says further down, and now uh, in, in uh, verse 13, and now abide faith, hope, and love, and these three. But the greatest of these is love. And I said to them, now replace the word love with the word God and read it through again. And I said, that's how God wants us to handle the brokenness of our families and the people in them and the people who are adversarial against us because they think we're, we're selfish. And then as another step, I said, replace the word love in, that, in those verses with your name. Graham suffers long and, and is kind. Graham does not envy. Graham does not parade himself. He's not puffed up. That's a challenge. That's a clear indication, if we're honest with ourselves, of where our character defects lie. It's one of the first passages I take people to who want to know about God. I want them to understand the character of love that is God a love that is strong enough to punish us, not punish us, but to guide us to a place where we can see we could have done that better, to be tough on us when we need to be. It's a love that that forgives. It's a love that is grace-filled. And when we understand that that is the character of God, it, it maligns all the man-made versions of God that are so keeping people away from faith. And so that's one of the first things I take them to. Then I take them to... Uh, to the Ten Commandments and get them to see that those are basic laws of love. The first four are about loving God who created you, and that makes sense because if you love he who created you, everything else should fall in. The last six are about loving your neighbour as yourself, and if you abide by the first four, then the last six are easy. And then we go to Matthew uh, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, which is a, a recipe for a good life. Everything Jesus said on the, on the Mount, the Sermon of the Mount, is a recipe for a good life. It, it requires us to be humble, to be courageous, to be self-sacrificing. And then we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. I mean, you don't need to have gone to Andrews University to do this. I have no pastoral qualification. I left school when I was 13. My only qualification is once I was blind and now I can see. And that's enough. That's enough. And, and God will use that. Look at the disciples. Look at who they were. Look at who they were. They were, they were rough and tumble, broken men who lived in a, and, and abounded in sin. And God used them in such a powerful way. And we're there, we're there ready to be used. We are the 11th hour workers and we are at the 11th hour. And, and it's my prayer that our church embraces that and shelves all those shackles and, and chains that bind it to corporate fear and to corporate regulation and start living in the armour of God, but not only living in it, trusting that it will deflect the arrows. It's one thing to put it on. It's another thing to trust it. Man, there's so much we could say. That's where my that's where my passion lies. It's where your passion lies. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's what drives Liam. Liam wants to get people into the lifeboat. So do I. I hope with all my heart that all my fears about this pandemic are wrong. Because if I'm right, a lot of people I love are going to be dead. A lot of people I love, and and there, a lot of people I love may die of the virus, and they may die of the of the of the, of the so-called cure. The only hope, the only certainty in all of this misinformation that pervades itself on both sides is the love of God. That's the only certainty. That's the only thing we can hold on to. Mm-hmm. And the people out there who don't get that yet are hungry for it. They see it in us when we speak. Hundreds of thousands see it when people mention Christ at the rallies, and a lot more of the speakers are doing that, and they want it. They're holding up crosses. They're holding up Bibles in the crowd. And when I said it at, at the, the first rally I spoke at that 
the organisers changed the day from Saturday to Sunday so I could live with my Sabbath, like Desmond Doss did, the crowd erupted in cheer. They cheered. They cheered for the Sabbath. Mm. I mean, if that isn't an opportunity, I don't know what is. And, and, and it's, it's exciting and it's also really scary because it means like I'm about to start saying, talking to people about coming out of her. I'm talking, I'm going to be talking about the system, the Babylonian system, as it looks in everyday life. You know, the way we consume, the way that we, we do faith, the way that all the religions are being combined, the way that the corporations rule everything in our life. And, and we can step out of that just by saying no. And instead of standing up like John the Baptist does and saying, repent, repent, uh, I know that thousands of people would turn their backs on me and walk away. But what I do is I say to them, I bet many of you lie awake at night and there are things that come into your thoughts that keep you awake, those things that nag away at you, those things I call the night demon. Well, what they are are blemishes on your character that you don't like. And you can surrender those blemishes. And the Bible talks about that. When the Bible says repent, it says make amends for those things that you've done wrong. Confess to them, own up to them, and get rid of them. Don't let them keep you awake at night. Live in the glory of God's grace. That's how I say repent. In biblical times when John said that, he was able to say say it the way he did. But in today's world, we have to adjust our language. But the message is still the same. Amen. Amen. Brother Larry, you have some thoughts? I just, you know, I I want us to be... uh keep to the positive I, I want i want the people in our administrating conferences and uh, pastors who are trying to trying to work their way through this i want everybody to be encouraged i don't want this to to be a discouraging event but at the same time i think i think it's true a lot of things that have been said are things that uh you know we're it's not like this just happened two weeks ago we, we've had a little bit of time to sort of regroup and think about this and and process it and investigate parts of it and have it have a uh, form form some understandings about what we think is happening uh, I, I think i think it's time for the church to be a lot more uh, our leaders to stand up and uh, be more accepting of, of uh, people who uh, choose not to receive the vaccination if that's what they choose mm-hmm. i think it's time for us to tell the government you know thank you for your advice We'll take that under advisement. We may not do what you say we have to do. Uh, we are going to live out our faith. And if the church can't do that, if a private business can do that and the church can't do it, the problem isn't with the private business. Mm. No, that's true. Amen. Among the four of us, there are some resources that might be helpful to people. Let's start with you, Liam. Uh, you've been studying with people and you have some resources in Australia that might be an encouragement to people. Take a few moments and talk about those resources there are some many great resources for bible studies i know amazing facts is uh, absolutely amazing a, a great resource that i have been very appreciative of as as well as secrets unsealed another another great ministry um and in regards to resources to to learn more about the whole COVID situation here in australia and uh, victoria we can include some web links to those uh, in the description of the of this of this video, or on uh, a web page with which this video will be available to see on. Wonderful, Graham. Tell us about Hoodies Helpers and anything else you're involved in. Yeah, Hoodies Hoodies Helpers. Um, I don't claim any credit for that. I, well, I don't claim any credit for anything that's going on at my end of the, the table. It's it's all Jesus. I was overwhelmed by by um, by messages of people threatening to take their own lives because they couldn't live anymore especially in the state of Victoria land when, when those things were happening down there with Daniel Andrews. And I put out a cry for help. Uh, I made a video and I said, look, we are overwhelmed by people. If, if there's anybody out there that's unemployed now who's got some mental health background, we need to get an army of people together. An army is not a good word either. A, a group, a community of people together who can help professionally to serve people. And within an hour, an enterprising Scottish lady living on a rusty old boat in the Brisbane River who'd lost her job as a mental health care nurse set up a Facebook page called Hoodies Helpers and she invited professionals to come on like her who could support. And it grew from there. And we're like, it it flies under our name, I guess, but it is of God and we love it and support it dearly. And it has grown also to, I believe, parts of the U.S., and to New Zealand and into Europe, there are people setting up, thinking of setting up hoodies helpers in in the UK 
and all it is is just setting up a community, a little tribe of people, like the 12 tribes of Israel coming together. And, and its main purpose is to make people feel that they're not alone and they're connected. And we, we're trying desperately not to have to raise money to keep it going because that brings forth insurances and accountability and all that sort of stuff. We're trying to keep it really simple. We're trying to manage the social um, media platforms as much as we can as groups of volunteer administrators. But at the end of the day, we have learned that the greatest driver of anxiety, fear and uh, depression and also addiction and ultimately suicide is a feeling of rejection and not being loved and a feeling of disconnection. And so by the group forming, it actually, it, it formed to set up a, a psychological hotline for people in, in dire straits. And that hotline is being set up now. It's taking a lot to set it up. But we realised that in creating the groups where people were coming together in their little towns or suburbs or areas and forming, that connection they were feeling was dissipating the desire people had not to want to live anymore. And that's grace and that's God. And it's a method to bring God into relationships and community. And it's going really, really well. There are Bible studies being done in those groups. There are people giving free haircuts. There's even a guy who makes false teeth, dentures, is offering free false teeth to people who can't afford them anymore. The opportunities are endless. They're, they're only limited by the scope of grace. And um, so that's been brilliant. Uh, I'm trying desperately to get men to step into a space of more empowerment because men have lost their way, clearly in so many ways and that's not getting men to learn how to get involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat it's to get men to function in a way that's practical that's strong that make that empowers women and children to flourish in the environment that those men live in mm -hmm. like the quiet the quiet sheepdog that sits on the hill that makes people feel safe um we've lost that as men and uh, we need to get that we need to get the joshua back in, into into our men and so there's another group i'm forming called hoodies heroes which is designed to get men to step into that space in a biblical way. So lots of resources, lots going on and lots of people involved. And it's just amazing. And we're just sitting back running this from our kitchen table at home and relying on the love and charity of all the volunteers who are pouring their lives and souls into it. Uh, the Hoodies Helpers is uh, all the W's, Hoodies, H-O-O-D-Y-S, Helpers, all one word, .com.au and uh, Hoodies Heroes, uh, that website's being developed at the moment, but uh, that'll be available. We'll ma make links available on the various Facebook and Telegram sites that we run. So all those links are being built as we speak. Our big problem is time. We, we, we spend a lot of time dealing with individuals and trying to support them and get them to where they need to be as well as get all this running as well. Getting thirty to 50,000 messages a week is really difficult. Um, most of them we just don't get to see. We look at them, they're encouraging, and we love the encouragement but we're mainly looking at them to find the people in need so we can get people where they need to be. So I, I've got no idea how to manage this, but I know God does, and that's enough for me. So every day is a new day. Amen. You're going to need a lot of help. Larry, yeah. tell us about Larry, the guy from Michigan. <laughs> yeah, I have. Um, uh, I opened a YouTube channel here a little more than a year ago, so uh, you can find it on YouTube. I put out a daily devotional every day, three or four-minute devotional, uh, and then I review books, uh, different things. I just reviewed one on Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum and spiritual books and different things. So that's at youtube.com slash C slash Larry, the guy from Michigan. I've got a audio podcast we do that is uh, totally based on uh, how does the church address living in the time of soft totalitarianism. We get usually about two of those out a week, and that's at subscribestar.com slash Larry, the guy from Michigan. And uh, people can subscribe to that. I have a website called greatcontroversy.org, which we began way back in the uh, six days of creation of the Internet, <laughs> 1997. And we have about a thousand resources on there, uh, sermons in print or in audio uh, on uh, video and different Bible studies and stuff, so on. And I have a couple of books I wrote that you can find scattered here and there. So those are some resources that I have. We're just trying to provide uh, for serious type Christian believers they want to be alive with present truth and maybe need need to look at things as a more serious way. We try to provide some of that kind of support by providing those materials. And, of course, I'm pastoring my two churches here in Muskegon and Fremont, Michigan. And if you're ever up this way, come on up. We will uh, we'll invite you in. You're welcome to worship with us in our churches. <laughs> Beautiful. I hope. I wish. We can't even cross the border to see my daughter and uh, and her and her children just two hours from here. So getting to the states at the moment is looking pretty grim. But 
one day, uh, but one day we'll meet in a better I hope way. so. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Jerry, make sure you tell us about Fulcrum 7, too, because that's a pretty important uh, site for us today. I have the privilege of being one of the founders and one of the editors at an online publication called Fulcrum 7. That is a publication that started up just about five years ago with uh, two simple goals in mind. Number one, to encourage our people. And number two, to provide a venue where people could write articles of stories, testimonies, theology, whatever it might be, that would get out there and reach people. Uh, the review wouldn't publish a lot of these things. And that's all right, because now we have a hub. We have a website that takes these articles. The Lord brings them in. I don't know what I'm doing. I rely on God. And he's, he brings articles in weekly and sometimes daily just the right things that people need to hear. And we also have a goal or a burden to let people know what's happening in the world and in the church in a way that might affect their life and their religious faith, to do that in a responsible manner. So that's our goal. And the website has grown rapidly over the last five years, uh, meteoric. I don't take any of the credit for that. I'm just thrilled to be able to watch it happen. Do you have any closing thoughts? Larry? No, just... Uh... Yeah, I appreciate each one, and we, we support. We want to see the, the formal church doing what it's called to do. And so we, we are ready to work with uh, all of our brothers and sisters and do it. Uh, we do have to do the Lord's work. And so, you know, they say lead, follow, or get out of the way. But let's, let's, uh, let's all of us let Jesus be our leader, and let's make sure that none of us are in the way. That's it. Would you be willing to close us with prayer, Graham? Lord, Father in heaven, what a privilege it is to speak about your plan for our salvation with love and respect for people who have differing views because that's the way you work. That's the way you do things. Lord, please empower us and our church leadership and our governing bodies and our governments and bureaucrats. Lord, please empower them to do your work and not your job. There is a big difference. May we be about doing your work and not your job. So, Father, as we step out in faith in the various things that we're doing, it's challenging. May we constantly remember that your armour, once donned, is bulletproof. And may we trust that it will hold firm against the arrows that fly at us. And, Lord, may it also allow us to emanate through it the love that you've given us in our hearts for our mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. Because, Lord, the best way to destroy our enemy is to make him our friend. And you've demonstrated that in so many ways in your life on earth and in the scriptures that you've given us to learn about our relationship with God and who God really is. So, Father, we ask you to bless Liam in the situation he finds himself in. Mm -hmm. Continue to encourage him in, on the journey of faith and rescue that he is on. It is a journey of rescue, Lord. And our purpose should now be to get as many people into the lifeboat as possible. The ship is sinking, and, Lord, we still have time. Lord, I pray for Larry and for Jerry, Lord, that their ministry is obviously uh, working beautifully together that they have stepped out on dangerous ground in some areas, but once again, they're wearing the armour of God. And nothing I've heard or seen in anything that they do or say makes me think otherwise. And Father, I pray that all those people who are seeking love and compassion through the Hoodies Helpers groups and the other things that we're doing here in Australia, Lord, that they will be blessed with a growing desire to know you and a growing fulfilment as you really reveal yourself to them. So Father, as we move forward, we can only ask for your Holy Spirit to fill us in every measure to guide and lead us to a place of better love and understanding, to step away from those things that distract and annoy us, to step away from the snares of Satan and into the love of Christ. May we have the courage to stand in the blood of the Lamb at the foot of the cross and plant our flag there because you make it happen, because you guide it to happen, and because it is your will is our prayer in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. Thank you, Larry, for organizing this and putting a great questionnaire together. Amen. Thank, Thank you, brothers. Thank you so much for coming, Liam and Graham and Larry. Till we Thanks meet again. Guys.